Okay, uh, thank you uh, very much for joining me. I appreciate the opportunity to participate today. I was supposed to come to Moscow at the end of this month to attend some conferences and hopefully speak at the center again. I've spoken several times before. Um, of course, that didn't work out, So, but, but this looks like a, a, a good way to still engage in a really important dialogue on this important topic uh, despite, despite the barriers. Um, as you can see from the outline, I'll, I'll start by saying a little bit more about myself. Um, then we'll talk about the kind of uh, two peak, the deadlock we're in at the moment, the, 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 the lack of uh, decision on what to do with some existing treaties, the collapse of some earlier ones, um, and then some of the reasons for that. Primarily, of course, the competition and distrust between the two governments. The uh, but there are longer-term forces at work as well about development of new technologies and the spread of these uh, military technologies to other countries. Um, and then we, of course, uh, had a long-term uh, difference between Russia and the United States about what should be the future of arms control. In some ways, these have been reduced, but in other ways, they've grown. And then I thought I'd end with some uh, discussion on what might be the long term, that is next decade or so, uh, of the global arms control regime uh, focusing on, on nuclear weapons in this case. Uh, but in the, uh, I hope to have a robust uh, question and answer and comment session with the audience and we can develop any of the points uh, I touched on in my talk on arms control. Uh, we can uh, uh, talk about some of the important related issues related to nuclear nonproliferation in, for example, regard as Iran or Korea, um, some of the other important issues related to Russia-U.S. relations uh, in general, uh, whatever you, know, th you, you, you think important and want to raise to the, the group I think would be welcome. Um, so just a bit about myself. Uh, I, uh, I, I would guess I would say I'm a Rebionek Khodnoi Voini. Sort of when I was in school, I studied Soviet arms control behavior. The, the federal government paid for us to learn Russian and study um, some of the nuclear forces and so on. This was in the um, towards the end of the Cold War, and then that, of course, lost interest in the '90s. There was a lot more attention to other issues, climate change, and so on. But in the last, and then the, the 2000s, there was more of a focus on counterterrorism. Uh, but in the last decade or so, there's been renewed interest in this whole question of great power arms control, great power competition, uh, renewed interest in, in Russian studies, um, and, and so on. Uh, so I've, I have a, I run a center at Hudson. It's a small one. We have a, though we have a robust internship program, and we focus a lot on and basically on two issues: one on these kind of uh, nuclear issues that is arms control, non-proliferation, and keeping nuclear material away from terrorists. And then we have a lot of work on the, the Russia-China-US relationship. How might that evolve? And in fact, I, the last time I spoke uh, at the American Center, I think it was on that, that, that uh, Russia-China-US uh, relationship. Um, so, but that said, uh, why the, the Russia-U.S. Uh, arms control relationship is important is that, as you know, we, we, this has been one of the few areas of uh, cooperation that uh, was existed both during the Cold War and after. For decades, Russia and the United States have decided it's to their advantage to uh, constrain or, and make more transparent their nuclear forces, nuclear activities, because they both benefited from the uh, insights they gain about future force planning, uh, possible savings in money from not developing systems. If, if they agreed, if, if both sides agreed not to develop a system, well, then that saves the funds they would they want they could use for other purposes. It made I think the competition even during the Cold War more stable. Uh, the governments, for example, made, made agreements to limit the number of warheads you could put on a single missile, and that was useful for discouraging a country from striking first with a small number of missiles in the hope that it could take out the other side's uh, warheads before they could be used and, and then have, gain some kind of superiority in, in a nuclear exchange. 
Um, and this was all fine, and the Cold War uh, restrictions were fairly robust. We kept on getting treaty after treaty, um, and they extended beyond the long-range nuclear systems to include the intermediate-range nuclear forces, and there were conventional forces agreements and so on. Um, but in recent years, we've basically been in deadlock ever since the United States and Russia agreed on the New START um, treaty, uh, SNV-3 in, in Russian. Uh, we've been in a in this stalemate in which the U.S. and Russian sides wanted to go in a different directions. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second, but in the meanwhile, while this was occurring and as a backdrop, we've seen a change in the conditions that made arms control um, um, a very uh, robust. There was one agreement after another and important. Of course, there's been this strategic competition and distrust between Russia and the United States, which, which makes it harder to uh, make concessions um, if uh, one country is seen as constantly cheating on a treaty or if they both see each other as treating, well, then that undercuts support for arms control in the domestic scene and, 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 and among as seen as it depreciates its value. Um, the also been these these new developments, new challenges, which have weakened the foundation of traditional arms control. So in the Cold War, it was pretty much a Russia-U.S. agreement, the process. So Moscow, well, more more, more accurately, uh, Soviet Union and the United States, but Moscow and Washington would had almost all the world's nuclear weapons, they had the most advanced delivery systems, very advanced sophisticated missiles, so if we focus agreements on those, that was making a, a very important uh, contribution to international security. Uh, but what's happened over the past decades is we've seen new kinds of technologies that, as the Russians point out, can have strategic effects like nuclear weapons, even if they aren't nuclear weapons. Um, so cyber weapons, high precision conventional weapons, counter space weapons, um, there's a, a, a growing list, artificial intelligence, of these new kind of technologies that could, we don't know because they haven't been, they're, they're new and they haven't really been used widely in war, but they could uh, potentially have the same effects of a nuclear attack. If you could take down the other side's command and control systems, wipe out its, its stock market, uh, and so on, well, that would be equivalent to uh, the damage you would feel from a nuclear strike. And I think, in a way, what we're seeing now with the pandemic is something like that. If we were to have a nuclear exchange, we would all be required to stay at home until the radiation dissipated and so on. So we, we can see how devastating these can be, even if it was a limited exchange. In addition to the development of these new technologies, we're also, we've also seen other countries develop really uh, robust, really powerful, sophisticated weapons um, that it's difficult for U.S. and Russian defense planners not to take into consideration. So, uh, if it, whereas we could agree to a treaty eliminating, uh, limiting, and actually eliminating uh, the Russian and so the Soviet Russian and the U.S. intermediate range nuclear forces, that is, ground based strategic uh, ballistic and cruise missiles having ranges of from 500 to 5,500 kilometers. Um, now you have dozens of countries have these kinds of missiles. Um, and in fact, China has thousands of these kinds of missiles. So it's kind of hard just to have a Russian-U.S. agreement uh, without these other, with, unless you include the other countries. Um, in addition, uh, many countries are developing robust, sophisticated weapons that are not nuclear, but really could put a strain on, on U.S. and Russian forces if we were to come into conflict. You know, biological weapons, chemical weapons, uh, high precision conventional strike weapons. And so it's difficult to, to say you give up all your nuclear weapons if you might need them to prevent other countries from using these as a form of deterrence. Um, and then, as I said, the spread to different countries.
countries, uh, we've seen China, uh, United Kingdom, Britain, uh, India, Pakistan, North Korea, and Israel reportedly have developed have developed arsenals of hundreds of nuclear weapons. Um, they, we've seen them even more develop go into missiles and so on. So it's basically these developments, the spread of te new technologies to, to different countries, um, has made it more difficult to continue this bilateral Moscow-Washington-oriented nuclear arms control process focused only on the, war, the, the, mo the most advanced systems of those two sides in the narrow nuclear realm. Um, and then this different direct phenomenon, it's interesting because we've had a bit of a flip here. At the time that New START was reached in 2010, the so R Russian government said, well, this is it in terms of negotiating Russian-U.S. arms control treaties. The next treaty really had to take into account these new technologies, um, above all, missile defenses, uh, be uh, but also some of the other ones, high-precision strike weapons and so on because Russia wouldn't feel comfortable lowering its forces if they would be, if, if, it, if these other for, uh, weaponry was not constrained. Um, at the same time, the uh, Russian government insisted that the arms control process had to broaden out to encompass new countries, above all Britain and France, but China as well and possibly India, Pakistan, and any other of the, the five nuclear weapon states recognized by the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, or uh, perhaps those that possess nuclear weapons, or even those that have the capacity to make nuclear weapons. It wasn't clear. We never proceeded. Um, and the Obama administration resisted. It wanted to go much lower in terms of the two sides' nuclear forces that saw a new start as a a bridging treaty with limits of, say, you know, 1,550 weapon uh, warheads on both sides. It felt comfortable going down to 1,000 to each side before needing to take into account these other technologies and countries. And so we, we never made much progress. And meanwhile, with you know, Crimea and everything else, uh, it, it just distracted the attention from the arms control reduction process. Okay, so we come into now 2017, new U.S. team takes over from the Obama administration, um, says it's committed to arms control, but interestingly, it adopts the Russian position. It says, yes, the, the, the Russians are right. We, we can't just focus on uh, these kind of long-range missiles uh, if other countries have them. And we need to address, uh, address above all China. I mean, from the point of view of the Trump administration, the main long-term global threat uh, to the United States is coming from the, the Communist Party of China, not, not, not Russia. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to sign arms control treaties that constrain Russian and U.S. systems and leave the Chinese systems unbound. And they can also note that China has been building up its nuclear forces, it's been building up its missiles and delivery systems, and from, you know, if the U.S. has got to go to war with China, it needs to optimize its forces to deal with, with, with China. Um, in, in addition, uh, the Trump administration also felt that there needed to address some uh, systems we hadn't covered before on, this, on the Russian side, particularly uh, non-strategic tactical nuclear weapons. and. And in return, it would uh, the U.S. would make some kind of arrangement to constrain systems that were of concern for Russia. But at the moment, we were in a situation where the Chinese have refused to engage in this formal arms control process, and the Russian government has backed off from the idea of insisting that that China has been included. It, it, the, as far as I understand it, the Russian position is fine. You, you know, if, if China wants to join the process, that would be fine. But we, Russia, are not going to try and put pressure on them to join. Uh, one, they're our most important ally. Uh, two, it won't work and it will just upset them. Um, but if the U.S. manages to persuade them, well, then Russia will, will join in. But we also have to deal with France and Britain and, and perhaps other countries as well. And we're at the point now where the New START agreement is going to expire next February. And we're still uncertain what's going to happen next. There, there are three possible solutions that are most discussed. One is you just simply allow it to expire. 
and then Russia, the United States, and China and others can just develop whatever nuclear forces they want. Um, and, and that will allow them to, 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 to optimize their, their force structure for what they consider necessary for security. Um, but the drawback is then you get into an un, uncontrolled arms race and you don't have a lot of transparency. Uh, so the uh, second option is, is the one preferred by the administration, which is to reach a new agreement, uh, which would include China and deal with some of these other uh, weapons. The, the problem is that we only have a few months left before New START expires and the Chinese have refused to even talk about this issue, so it would be difficult to negotiate a new treaty in time before New START expires. So the third option uh, is that the treaty allows both sides to extend it by up to five years. It has the advantage of not requiring congressional approval in the U.S. since getting Senate approval for um, anything is just very difficult, uh, particularly now with the with with the uh, distractions of, from from the, the COVID-19 virus and so on. Um, and the Russian side, you know, they, when I was last in Moscow, the Russian uh, uh, foreign ministry experts were saying they have to actually go back to the Duma even to extend the treaty. And this could take up to six months. Um, it's a long process. But having seen how quickly the the Duma ratified the proposed constitutional amendments uh, offered by President Putin of, uh, earlier this year, I would think that if President Putin said, "Look, Duma, this is in the national security of the interests of Russia. We need to extend the treaty," um, he would probably get the approval rapidly. So, so that seems to me the most likely option, but the Trump administration is still debating how much longer it can put pressure on Russia to then turn put pressure on China by delaying ratification, uh, extension of the treaty. And there are some who think we shouldn't extend it anyway because then it would just get, draw away attention from the need to transform arms control in the way of including more countries and so on. Um, or if there is an extension, it might be shorter than five years, perhaps one year, just to keep the, 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 the pressure high. Uh, so what is this all going to lead to? Um, long term, if you want to think about where we might end up with, with in terms of global arms control the next decade out, I could see sort of three scenarios that are uh, available. So one would be this sort of unbounded competition. It wouldn't be unlimited because countries wouldn't limit their spending on nuclear weapons in any case because they need conventional weapons and need to deal with the coronavirus and other priorities. But it wouldn't be limit, bounded by treaty. Each country could develop the nuclear forces it wanted and could then develop uh, other means to help them, artificial intelligence and so on. Um, so you get a lot of arms racing, you get a lot of high expenditure, and a lot of freedom of action for the great powers. Um, we've been in these scenarios before. You know, it's not clear how if this would be as bad as in the past because you have all these new technologies and so on. Countries are still going to be cautious about going to war uh, because we don't really know what would happen with, uh, if, we, if, if everybody started launching cyber attacks on each other and use artificial intelligence to guide their, their armed forces, what, what impact that would be. Um, but it would probably have a negative effect on the non-proliferation regime. I would think that other countries, North Korea, perhaps Iran, perhaps the Iranian neighbors would all say, well, you know, in this environment, we need our own nuclear weapons to protect ourselves. The second scenario is what the administration wants. And so it's also what many of the peace groups in the U.S. and elsewhere want, which is a a stronger arms control regime that covers many countries. Um, some propose all countries, but at least many countries. Uh, and it would be a multilateral binding treaty uh, limiting or eliminating their nuclear forces, constraining their strategic defenses, their missile defenses, limiting applicability of some new technologies like nanotechnology and so on for military purposes. Um, and that's the you know the, the 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 dream of the Trump administration as well, but it's really hard to, to see how you get there. It's possible. So let's just say we had a nuclear war between Pakistan and India. 
or this virus is so devastating that countries decide, look, we can't risk another global, global collapse with a nuclear war, we can't spend all this money on nuclear weapons, we really need to take the, to eliminate the, this other danger to mankind and use the money for health care and so on. So it, it's possible if we, have a, if we have a real major global shock, but it's not probable. The probable scenario, in my view, is a sort of last scenario of patchwork progress. So you may not get formal treaties and everything, but you get informal agreements. So China wouldn't sign on to uh, S and B, you know, Piat or whatever it would be. Instead, it would agree to limit its forces at below a certain level, but in turn, it could have more. Uh, conventional armed missiles. You'd see transparency agreements. You know, maybe countries would tell a bit more about their uh, nuclear force plans. They avoid provocative activities such as pushing their nuclear forces too close to each other's borders, uh, keeping them on a lower alert level. You may see uh, limits on further abstention from nuclear weapons testing uh, and so on. Um, in the third scenario, it's very unclear, though, how this is going to affect on the non-proliferation regime. You know, the first one, unbound competition, well, then everyone who can will get their nuclear weapons. In the arms control renewal, then nobody needs them. Nobody would have them. Um, in the third one, will other countries say it's enough? So one argument you've heard in the past is that it's important for the U.S. to have nuclear weapons because it, 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 by guaranteeing to use them or offering to use them to defend other countries, Japan, South Korea, NATO, then there's less of incentive for Germany or, you know, or South Korea or, or, or Australia or whatever to get their own nuclear weapons because the U.S. will defend them. But who knows how long that will last. Um, so neither of these, you know, scenarios are, are are perfect. I still prefer the third scenario. That's where I push along in my own work. But the last few years, we're heading more towards the, the the first scenario of unbounded competition. But now, with the wild card of the of this this virus and so on, and maybe there'll be changes in the leadership of you know, the, the Russia and the United States that will, will have a more enthusiastic approach to nuclear arms control. So it's not excluded. All right, those are my uh, general observations. And I understand that you can, you're you now able to make comments or ask questions to me via Skype. So let's um, go ahead and switch to that format. Let me just make sure I can see the screen. All right, there we go. Okay, they all came in at once. Um, let's see, it's a bit, um, so I'll read the questions aloud to everybody. So, uh, question one from um, uh, when the U.S. ratify CTBT. Yeah, so CTBT is the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. It was signed by United States, Russia, China, and many other countries. But it's not come into force because it requires um, uh, many countries that have the potential to make nuclear weapons to ratify it. And I think there are six, seven, eight countries that haven't done that. Um, and that's countries you might expect, India, Pakistan, North Korea. But it's also the United States and China. Um, uh, Russia has, has uh, ratified the agreement a long time ago. Uh, um, and the debate in the U.S., there was a push uh, under President Clinton to ratify it. Uh, but there was a concern that if you forever deny your, the, yourself the opportunity to test nuclear weapons, that over time the existing nuclear weapons may work less effectively. Countries and, and military leaders may doubt they would actually work in a fight, so other countries would 
will lose the U.S. Would, uh, extent guarantees would lose credibility. The, the 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 threats of mutual deterrence would weaken. So the solution we've come up with is the stockpile stewardship program, in which we use high in, uh, high intensity lasers and and other means to simulate nuclear explosions. Um, and you can test the nuclear warheads, the non-fissile material, to make sure that they work. Um, and each year, the uh, heads of the nuclear weapons laboratories are required to certify that, yes, the, the nuclear stockpile is still working. But the under both President Clinton and then President Obama, when he tried to get it, the argument has been in the Senate, well, we're not sure this is going to work forever. So why would we, it's safer not to ratify a treaty if we, we may need to get out of it later. Um, the Chinese position, as, as far as I understand, is, is they'll ratify it as soon as the U.S. ratifies it. But even if the U.S. ratifies it, it still wouldn't go into effect because India, Pakistan, North Korea, and so on have not, uh, won't ratify it either. Um, so where we are now is seems a stable situation in which nobody tests nuclear weapons uh, um, except for North Korea, and they, they stopped doing that. So you basically have the treaty operating, even if it's not a formally ratified. But most you know, international legal experts, arm control experts, would prefer that the U.S. would ratify. It's not going to happen in the next year. If the Democrats come into power and uh, in both, particularly the Senate as well as the presidency, they may try renewal, but they would need to get two thirds of the Senate to agree to ratify it. And they would have to make that a priority over, for example, build, renewing or making a new New START treaty. So I don't think it's going to happen soon. I'm a little, I'm not too concerned about it. I would oppose uh, and, and be more concerned if there was nuclear testing, but that no one's planning that at the moment. Um, as civilians, second question, as civilians, what can we do to help facilitate peace between our countries? Um, and she's uh, an American living in beautiful Moscow, as she puts it. There's not much. I mean, <clears throat> there was uh, in the 50s, of course, those large ban the bomb protests. Uh, in the 80s, when I was in England studying, we, we saw a lot of protests against the U.S. missile deployments in, 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 in Britain and Europe uh, to, against the Soviet Union. And they had some effect of pressuring governments to sign arms control treaties. Um, but, you know, we really would need a new wave like that. And the younger generation I've seen, they're not... This isn't an issue that grabs them as much as it did my generation. So if you're now in your 20s or teens, your main concern has been climate change, for example. You see that as a more existential threat. So you're going to do walkouts and activism on that. There's not a lot of pressure for the popular level for, for the in, in U.S. or Russia to reduce nuclear weapons. Um, the, there is a push for a nuclear ban treaty and a lot of part of developing countries and, and some of our allies about to push for that. But they're, it's not a, a high priority for them. They, they agree to the treaty, they've ratified it, but they're not, there's not a big push to enforce it and, and, make, it, and make it fully effective. Um, so I, I don't think there's much the people, individual people can do under current conditions. Um, that said, you know, with this this COVID if the, the, this virus scare, if it, if it frightens enough people and kills enough people to say, look, we don't we don't need nuclear weapons because that will give us the same kind of crisis. Well, then maybe we'll see renewed activism, um, but we haven't seen it yet. Okay, next question, uh, and let me I guess scroll down a bit. Would you please tell me what? happen there and uh, in Russia and the U.S. currently, um, let's see, tell me what happened, uh, Russia and the U.S. currently part of current arms control treaty, yeah. Um, so, yes, Russia and the U.S. are limited by several treaties. The main one is, as I said, the SNV treaty, the New START treaty, uh, which limits their long-range ballistic, uh, long-range nuclear delivery systems. Those are ballistic missiles based on land, 
on on air uh, submarines or uh, shorter range missiles on uh, long range bombers. Um, and those limits will expire in February, but push to extend those limits by extending New START. Some, though, treaties have died. So the INF Treaty, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Force Treaty, which limited the, the ballistic and cruise missiles of Russia and the U.S. within the 500, 5,500 kilometer range, those have expired. That's expired, and there's not any major effort to renew that. In fact, the U.S. is planning to deploy missiles precisely of those range um, in Asia because China has so many missiles like this. And the U.S. wants a counterbalance, and then, of course, Russia will need to take that into account in how its defenses is of Vladivostok and so on. So we're seeing a bit of a potential arms race in that area. Um, but there are other treaties. You know, we agree we're still uh, members of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, and that obliges us to commit to nuclear disarmament, to not share or transfer nuclear weapons to other countries, to, but to also work and promote uh, civilian commercial uh, nuclear energy technologies. Um, there are other uh, arms control treaties in uh, related to biological weapons, chemical weapons, um, some transparency measures. But the big one really is the New START treaty. So as SNV, uh, SNV3 expires and is not extended or replaced, then that's a really bad sign about the future of arms control. Uh, let's see. May we have court breach hearings over treaty breach breaches? Um, you know, the treaties are contracts and a breach. What right can uh, can countries just do this without punishment? Um, well, unfortunately, the legal mechanisms in this area are weak. So North Korea joined the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. It benefited from receiving a lot of technology under the treaty and, and learning about and uh, developing a nuclear reactor. And then it, when it was caught cheating, it decided to withdraw. Um, and, and so it, it, was, it denied future uh, 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 cooperation. But it basically, this is a, a, it was an alarm people that other countries could do the same. Um, there are a lot of uh, treaties on humanitarian means of war, and some people have, have tried to apply those against nuclear um, weapons and, and being not, you know, and disproportionate uh, and humanitarian consequences of nuclear war be so great that there's nothing, we, nothing would justify that kind of, of use. Um, but the national governments have all pretty much rejected did that either on jurisdiction grounds or citing their supreme national interests in self-defense. So there's not really a good treaty. There, there has been some enforcement. It's basically been through the UN Security Council. So Russia, the US, China, France, and Britain, the main permanent members, plus who's ever on the rotating two-year seats in this council, can vote to adopt and apply non-proliferation sanctions um, and so we've seen them do this a lot in the case of Iran and North Korea, but not in the case of other countries. And we also see some governments, particularly the U.S., apply its own sanctions on basis of national law. But that annoys um, and, and triggers protests from Russia, China, and other states because the U.S. is basically applying its national laws to their companies, their people. Uh, and pushing, putting sanctions on them for, for example, assisting an Iranian nuclear or missile program um, in the absence of a UN Security Council resolution. So the, it's not really a legal, the enforcement's not legal. It's more threats of retaliation um, and under mutual assured destruction uh, and other mean national means. Even in the enforcement mechanism, when you have treaties, you have generally means of verification, sometimes on-site inspection, but it's typically the national tactical means of verification, i.e. Russian and U.S. satellites looking over each other, that's seen as the main means of detecting violations. Another question. Um, so you don't think that nuclear weapons can be absolutely forbidden 
in the whole world. Um, you can do that, and, and we've seen there's a new treaty that's gained force. It drew, came out of this humanitarian movement. Um, the, the, uh, there's been a big push for a, a weapon, uh, a treaty like we have in with biological weapons, like we have with chemical weapons, that would, rather than the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which let some keep, countries keep nuclear weapons for a while until they disarm them and other countries are denied them at all, would just simply ban all nuclear weapons. No country could have them, no country could make them, sell them, use them, and so on, just eliminate them all immediately. But the Russia and the U.S., despite their agreement, disagreements on many issues, have agreed that this treaty is impractical, um, that it would, and then there are a lot of national concerns in the U.S. Well, if we can't, don't have nuclear weapons, how do we defend Germany? How do we defend South Korea and so on? And those countries also feel that concern. So this treaty has gained a lot of support from countries, but they're typically countries that are don't have nuclear weapons. Uh, those that do all oppose them, and those that are protected by countries that have nuclear weapons, such as NATO countries, tend not to support the treaty either. So the treaty's been gaining in ratification. At some point, it may be formally enter into force, but it doesn't really have an execution mechanism. It's not clear who would determine which countries are in violation and what's the means to violate her. So it's not seen as anything really practical yet. So we will probably have nuclear weapons indefinitely until they are rendered harmful harmless by some means of defense or superseded by some other kind of weapon that is considered to be um, uh, more useful or we have the world government able to uh, force everybody to do whatever it wants, which is had, brings its own problems. Uh, next question, how likely are changes in nuclear arms control policies with a possible change of president in Russia and the U.S.? Yeah, that's, that's sort of where my thinking is going, so that I think that President Putin is very distrustful of the U.S. and would probably not uh, agree to uh, put major constraints in Russian nuclear forces. And President Trump, it's a bit hard to get a hold of his thinking. So at some points he says that, you know, he wants to eliminate these weapons, and he wants to save the money. Um, and, he want, and you know, he wants to get a Nobel Peace Prize from eliminating Korea and so on. But at other points he says, well, the U.S. has the strongest nuclear arsenal. I plan to keep it that way. And so it, if Bernie Sanders or, some, uh, or someone else in the more in the progressive spectrum, the U.S. were coming to power and perhaps the Yablaka or somebody came into power in, in, in Russia, you, might, you could probably get stronger arms control agreements. We still have the problem with China, though. You, the, the President Xi is also not a big fan of, of nuclear arms control. So you probably would need changes in government in all three countries that would be more inclined to push for nuclear arms reductions, either because they're more cooperative or because they had other priorities. Um, so that's I think that's almost a prerequisite, that there would be limits to how uh, how much arms control you can, can get it, it, until you see different na national leaders with more enthusiastic about arms control. I uh, uh, it looks to me like the list is is and I don't see any more. Um, can does anybody want to make comments too? I'm happy to read them aloud to the group uh, if if you want to contribute your in, your insights or ask additional questions. Okay, seeing none, I'll just wait for the moderator to tell me what, what we do now. Ah, here comes one. Why do we have a difference in the application of the MPT treaty? Uh, I'm going to provide an example. There are suspicions that Iran is developing a nuclear weapon program. Yeah, so this has been a problem with the, the non-proliferation treaty. At the time it was signed, the only way to get full, 
whole agreement was to sort of grandfather those countries that had nuclear weapons at the time. So in the night, like that initially it was a Russia, US, Soviet, US project, but the Chinese and the French opposed because they thought this was a, an effort by the, the, the Washington and Moscow to roll and to, to prevent them from having nuclear weapons. Um, and then they swung around behind the treaty once it agreed to allow them to keep it, same with the British, but and signed the treaty. But the treaty still says that, okay, you, know, you five countries also happen to be the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, you have to reduce your nuclear weapons over time as conditions allow. Um, and countries like, uh, some countries, well, many countries actually have expressed concern that these reductions haven't occurred fast enough and are not, the, the, the existing nuclear powers are not, not meeting their, their disarmament obligations. But you also have some countries which philosophically oppose the, uh, this treaty because it's not, it doesn't treat all countries equally. So India formally, a uh, formal position why it refused to sign the treaty was because it, it felt that, you know, it was giving, it was not legitimate to give India lower status than, for example, China. Um, Pakistan's not signed it, probably because of India and, and, and so on. So it's, it's a problem that the treaty, uh, a, a fundamental treaty is how do you say, why, why can, you know, we Americans and Russians say we get to keep our nuclear weapons, but you, Iran, you can't have them. Um, the, the argument has always been that, well, we, and but now I've heard this argument in the case of India too, India, the responsible nuclear actors, they don't use the weapons, on their don't share them, so it's safe for them. But, you know, if Iran gets them, it's uh, then uh, the Turkey, uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, many other countries would get them in response. That would be very destabilizing. You could easily see that they would be more inclined to use them. To, so to, to, if Iran gets them first, maybe it would threaten Saudi Arabia with a nuclear strike if the Saudis tried to catch up. Um, you're just, the more countries that have these weapons, the more likely they're to be used. So you'd have to make arguments not on the basis of fairness or equity, but just pragmatic considerations that it's better to have fewer nuclear weapons than, than more, and it's better that you have fewer countries that can use nuclear weapons than more. But it, it's hard. It's a real hard argument to make. Um, and then this, the, the person gave a little more detail. I see it now. Um, yeah, South Korea had a nuclear program at some point, correct? Um, uh, yeah, so yeah, South Korea was found, not only South Korea, so South Africa, Argentina, Brazil, um, I think it's Australia, Sweden, many countries at various points have looked at the nuclear option. It's sort of understandable um, it, you know, that, that you'd want to con at least consider whether you could get them. Japan did several reviews. Um, in general, though, they've all decided that it's better that if it's it's better not trying to get them because if you try and get them, well then other your neighbors will get them, so you're all going to be worse off. The U.S. has was going to impose all these sanctions on you as we did with India and threatened to do in the case of South Korea and, and other allies if they tried to get it. So, you know, it's been more U.S. pressure. Presumably, Russia's also thrown its weight in if. And, and, and tried to actually prevent China from getting nuclear weapons, so that process apparently backfired. Um, but there's, there, it's basically national efforts to try and enforce the treaty. So in the case of Libya, uh, you, you, you could get a lot of pressure on uh, and the part of uh, the NATO countries for Libya to back off its nuclear program and eventually did in return for sanctions relief. Um, in the case of Syria, the Israelis took care of that nuclear reactor using unilateral force, same in the case of Iraq. Um, so it's a bit of a free-for-all. You have to rely on countries to use sanctions, military force, and so on to enforce it, rather than a, a, a UN body. It's not, it's been, it's not exclusive. So as I said, the Russia, the U.S., and other countries have use the UN Security Council to prevent Iran and, and South and North Korea from, from getting nuclear weapons. But often the problem is one of these countries is allied 
um, to one of the UN Security Council members. So Russia will defend Syria and the US will defend Japan and South Korea from any UN sanctions. So it's pretty much a national enforcement effort. Let's see if there's anything else. Uh, you mentioned new types of weapons that may supersede nuclear weapons. Are they already being regulated? Um, or are we going to end up in the same path as nuclear weapons? But there's a lot of talk about it, because the best time to regulate these new weapons is before they're, we've actually spent a lot of money to build them and deploy them, because once they're, they're out there, it's just harder to roll them back. There's been a lot of talk now about the new systems Russia about to deploy. Um, these include some systems such as a more modernized uh, ground-based missile, um, hypersonic missiles launched from planes and ships and so on that you could fit within the existing framework. So they would, the Russian government has agreed, some of them would fall under new start limits uh, if extended. But some of them do not. Um, this, this cruise missile that could fly all over the world forever um, which, which of course, the U.S. dropped abandoned because it kept crashing, and, and apparently the Russian program is having its own problems. Or this long-range torpedo that can carry a nuclear warhead into New York or L.A. and blow up and create such a massive fallout that the cities become unusable. They don't fall under New START. You, you could extend it, you, you know, and the U.S. would obviously push to get new provisions and any new treaty that would restrict these systems. Systems. And the Russians have been pushing to include the U.S. systems based in Europe that are technically shared with NATO or above all the U.S. missile defenses, which Russia says are strategic weapons need to be controlled. But beyond that, some of the newer ones, artificial intelligence, cyber weapons, it's been a lot of talk, but it's these factors, technological proliferation, uncertainty, strategic competition have made it hard. Um, and enforcement would be difficult. You, you think there's some possibility. So, for example, Russia, China, and U.S. are all developing hypersonic weapons, which fly very fast, but more importantly, fly somewhat unpredictably, so they're less vulnerable to missile defenses. You would think they, they would want to at least cooperate and prevent other countries from getting them. Um, artificial intelligence, there's been some dialogue with, between the U.S. and China. China's really gone gung-ho for artificial intelligence in this realm and others. And the problem is, though, that if you allow an algorithm to decide when you use a nuclear weapon, um, that just leads to a, a, all sorts of worries about whether whoever wrote that algorithm actually thought of all possible scenarios and whether there's a human loop to stop it and so on. So we're at the point of talks, discussions, often run through the UN. Russia's offered some proposals, for example, on, and helped set up some working working groups on cyber weapons. But at the moment, uh, we haven't seen much progress in this, and the attention is focused on New START. I think rightly so. I think if you can get New START renewed, then that would give you, would give you more time to address these new technologies. Um, another question. What's the closest the world has been to an actual nuclear war? Probably Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, you know, Khrushchev's harebrained scheme. He, 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 he was boasting of Soviet nuclear weaponry advantages after the Soviet Union had the first space um, uh, satellite and then the first person in space. Um, and that alarmed the U.S. and so the U.S. launched its own nuclear weapons program, no missile program, and then the U.S when it had satellites of its own, discovered that his boasts were empty, that the Soviet Union didn't have all these missiles. They weren't coming out of factories like sausages, as Khrushchev said. And so the U.S. had an advantage, and that alarmed Khrushchev. And, and his decision to, to rectify the balance was to sneak nuclear weapons into Cuba and then publicly announce them that they are there, and that would rectified the balance, but the U.S. found out as when they were being deployed about them and put a blockade in Cuba, and, and we came close because apparently we didn't know at the time some of the Russian uh, Soviet commanders in Cuba were authorized to use their nuclear weapons in self-defense. So if the U.S. had invaded Cuba to destroy the weapons, Russian forces could have used them. That's probably the closest. We've had some other call, close calls, less serious during the, the in 1973, both forces went on alert. Um, we've had 
uh, a case, I think, under President Yeltsin when uh, the Soviet command uh, system, uh, the early warning system, detected a, a, a commercial or space launch vehicle as a possible nuclear weapon aimed at Russia. But uh, unfortunately, the person who was seeing the data uh, decided, no, this couldn't be correct. Um, and we've had war scares whenever the tensions have arisen, of course. Um, but the Cuban Missile Crisis is definitely the closest, and it was after the Cuban Missile Crisis, indeed, that it shocked the, the world and to shock at least Moscow and, and, and Washington into pushing for the new direct arms control agreements led to the ABM Treaty, the, the uh, SALT Treaty, and so on. So it's possible that um, if we get another nuclear scare or even an actual nuclear weapon in Pakistan, that would galvanize arms control and disarmament, but it's just a very risky, very costly way to do that. Um, uh, okay, I'm getting a lot of thank yous, just comments. Let me see if there's anything else. Uh, okay, okay, I see a question or at least a comment. Um, as a, yeah, let me go up a bit because I think they're all coming in now. Um, so one comment. Uh, the U.S. left the INF Treaty after Russia had posted a photo from a base in Kubnica where it was assumed that the rock in the photo was a breach of the INF Treaty. Russia, Russia exited after the U.S. exited. Um, thereafter, Europe was considered to be in direct threat or possible interest conflict and real military conflict between the U.S. and Russia. It was revised that the new START Treaty's renewal will eliminate these issues. Yeah, so people have been talking about okay, we don't have INF, but there's no reason we can't ex add these kind of systems into a new start limit, either under existing treaty or new treaty. So you could maybe allow both Russia and the U.S. Or, and even China have their own missiles between the range of 500 and 5,000 kilometers and up. Um, and some countries, such as China, might want to have more intermediate range systems. Some countries, such as the U.S., might want to have more longer-range systems, and some countries, like Russia, might want to have a mix. So you're, it, it, the INF Treaty collapsed, so we're not going to get it back but directly, but we could maybe tuck it in to some new treaty. Um, that's a good comment. Another comment. Um, Uh, well, thank you for all your thank yous. I think I, I don't see another comment or question yet, but we have five, seven minutes if anybody wants to add one. And Nis Desnitsis, I can read Russian, so if you want to write it in Russian, I'm happy to read it out loud to the group. That's better for you. I can't write in Russian, though, so I always have to do this in English, so I definitely understand if somebody wants to write in Russian. Yes. Yeah, I don't see anything else. Um, so just then thank you and let's do this again sometime. Um, maybe we can have a talk after the, the U.S. presidential election and discuss what we might see in the you know, future going forward. But thank you very much for your time. Thank you.